right. Everybody's like ready for the weekend, I think, right? Ready for the weekend? Yes. Yeah, right, right, after our second winter. All right, guys. All right, let's listen uh, up. Hey, so the respiratory system. Um, we can divide the respiratory system up into uh, an upper respiratory system and a lower respiratory system. And um, so you've heard of upper respiratory infections, lower respiratory infections, right? An upper respiratory, um, the upper respiratory system is going to be from the larynx on up. And so the larynx is the area, there's a lot of cartilage in there, and you want to think about like where your Adam's apple is. So everywhere from there on up, that's upper respiratory, okay? Everything from the Adam's apple on down, that is the lower respiratory system. Okay? So we're going to go over some structures um, of each. Now, the respiratory system is basically what you're doing is bringing air uh, into, you're bringing air into the lungs because once the air gets in the lungs, the oxygen can get into your tissue or into your bloodstream and your blood then can deliver the oxygen to your tissues, okay? Um, then the tissues are gonna make carbon dioxide. That's a waste product. The carbon dioxide goes back into the blood, goes back to the lungs, and then you can breathe it out. So that's really what we're doing with the respiratory system is we are we are getting the oxygen in and the carbon dioxide out. So here's the upper respiratory system right here. And we have, um, starting with the nostrils here, um, those, another name for that are the external nares. Uh, so in your notes, you're going to see external nares. In your textbook, they've changed the name just to nostrils. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the nasal cavity in here, um, this whole thing in here is the nasal cavity. It's divided into two nasal cavities by that ethmoid bone, right? That perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone and that little vulnar. Um, and in there are these um, projections there, these bumps. And those bumps are called the nasal concha. Some people say concha. Okay? But they're um, the nasal concha, they're just bumps. And there's three of them. So there's the superior, the middle, and the inferior concha. They are lined by a mucous membrane so that when you are breathing in dust and particles and bacteria, um, the mucous membranes will secrete a mucus and then it traps those particles. Okay, so you're not going to breathe that down into your lungs. The other things they do is they're like uh, little rocks in a stream so it slows the air down and warms the air up. So by the time that air gets down to your lungs, it's going to be clean and warm and slower. Right? Then it's going to leave the nasal cavity through the internal nares. That nasal cavity narrows down um, and then we, we call that the internal nares. Um, the textbook again has a new word um, which yeah so internal nares. <laughs> All right um, and then that's going to lead into your throat and the throat is called the pharynx. The pharynx and there's three parts to the throat. Um, the first part of the throat here is very close to the nasal cavity, so we're going to call that the nasal pharynx. Okay, so pharynx is throat, it's close to the nasal cavity, so that's the nasal pharynx. The second part here is right <coughs> behind the oral cavity, it's right behind your mouth, so we call that part the oral pharynx. And then the third part is right um, by right on top of those that cartilage area that we call the larynx. So we call that the laryngeal pharynx. Okay, so we divide the throat, the pharynx, up into those three parts. Um, in the nasal cavity, at the um, bottom of the nasal cavity, we have the hard palate, and from behind that, we have the soft palate and the uvula. We'll talk more about that in the digestive system. When the laryngeal pharynx gets down to the larynx area where all those cartilage are, it'll divide into two tubes. The tube posteriorly, the tube in the back, is called the esophagus. That's where your food goes down. The tube in the front, that is called the trachea. That's your windpipe. So your windpipe is more anterior, okay? And then in this um, larynx area, we're going to go over 
the cartilage that's in there. The first cartilage that we see is this cartilage here, um, and it acts as a um, kind of like a cover for the opening to the trachea. So the opening of the trachea is called the glottis, and that cartilage that will cover it is called the epiglottis, the epiglottis. It covers the opening. It covers the glottis. So when you swallow, the tongue and the muscles in your throat push the epiglottis down, and it covers the trachea opening, and your food is forced to go down your esophagus. Okay? So that's, that's how that's forced to go down there. Um, so those are some of the structures in the upper respiratory system. In the lower respiratory system, and we're going to go over all of these as well, um, in the lower respiratory system then, here's the, here's the um, larynx right here with all those pieces of cartilage we'll talk about. That's going to lead into the trachea. The trachea divides into two primary bronchi. So there's a primary, uh, right primary bronchus and a left primary bronchus. The primary bronchi divide into secondary bronchi. Um, and those, I think, in your new textbook are called lobar um, bronchi because they're going to go to each of the lobes of the lungs. And we're going to talk about how it all keeps branching after that. Right? We're going to talk about the lung. Um, the, the lower respiratory system will go all the way down through the primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, into the bronchioles, and all the way down to the little air sacs called alveoli. So as we go through, we're going to talk about all of that. But um, lower respiratory system is from the larynx on down. So if we look at some of the tissues that cover this, this area, <coughs> this is the epithelium that covers the trachea. Do you guys recognize that epithelium? What does that look like to you? It's ciliated. So it's, and it's columnar. And it's pseudostratified. So that's pseudostratified um, columnar, ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. So here's the, the cilia. Remember, the cilia acts like um, they, they move things across the surface of the cells. So they are um, acting like a respiratory escalator, basically. This is what it actually looks like. All those cilia look like a shag carpet. Okay, and they are constantly moving, moving the mucus and the dust and the particles back up your trachea so that you can cough it out, swallow it down, just get it out of the trachea. <clears throat> okay. Um, these are the cartilages that are in your larynx area. Okay, and so we have a model that looks just like this. Um, the Adam's apple, this is the thyroid cartilage. So the thyroid cartilage is called, that's the Adam's apple. Okay. And then right below that is another cartilage that's called the cricoid cartilage. And then below the cricoid cartilage starts the trachea. And there's other cartilages around the trachea. So you got the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and then up here is the epiglottis. Right? Now, if we look at the back side of, the, the tr of that larynx area, we can see the thyroid cartilage again. And it doesn't really have a back to it, so it's really just a shield on the front of your throat. And then the cricoid cartilage does go all the way around, and it's actually a little bit wider on the back. And then there's the epiglottis. Okay, so the epiglottis closes over the opening, um, so it's going to close over the opening going into the trachea. There's also a whole bunch of other ligaments in here. Those are your vocal ligaments, and we're not going to go over those individually. You just need to know collectively those are your vocal cords or your vocal ligaments in that area. So then um, right below the cricoid cartilage starts the trachea. And the trachea is, it has several um, rings around it. It's about, you know, four, it's about four to six inches long and it has a lot of rings on it. Um, the rings are open in the back. So if we look at the back, we can see that there's C-shaped rings that are open in the back 
And that's because what sits right behind here is the esophagus. And what goes down the esophagus? Food, right? So when you have big bulky food going down that esophagus, you want it to be able to expand a little bit. So it's going to expand into that trachea area. Okay, and not lodge, not get lodged in the esophagus. Okay, then here are, here's a picture just showing that glottis. The glottis is the opening into the trachea. Just showing it open. Okay, there it's open. And then, um, and then it can, it'll close as well um, for sound, to produce sound. Okay, so there's the closed and there's the open. Right now, um, boys, when they reach puberty, testosterone makes those vocal cords thicker, right? And then their voice drops. That's what causes it to, to drop lower. All right, so here's our trachea then. And um, we can see it's going to go all the way down and divide into two primary bronchi. So you'll have to name the left primary bronchus and the right primary bronchus on your um, lab exam. And then the primary bronchi divide into the secondary bronchi. So we're going to see that the right lung has three lobes to it, so it'll have three secondary bronchi. The left lung has only two lobes to it, so that it'll be only two um, secondary bronchi. And again, in your book, they call them lobar, not secondary. All right, so here um, we can see the divisions. This is one of the diagrams that will be on your lab exam. So you can see the primary bronchus divides into the secondary bronchus, bronchi. And then the secondary bronchus will divide into these um, uh, tertiary bronchi, which in your new book is segmental bronchi, and then the tertiary bronchi will divide into bronchioles. So for the test taking, I, I'm going to stick with the old terminology, which goes from primary to secondary to tertiary bronchi, and then it goes um, down to the bronchioles, just so you know. All right, and so then the bronchioles, we can look at, there's two different types of bronchioles. There's a terminal bronchiole, and then there's a respiratory bronchiole. And I just want you to see, as we're coming down from the primary bronchus to the secondary bronchus to the tertiary bronchus, we see that cartilage starting to break up. So instead of having those C-shaped rings that we had in the trachea, it starts to break up, and it actually starts to look more like a giraffe's neck, right? And by the time we get down to the bronchioles, the reason why we call them bronchioles is because there's no longer any cartilage on them. Okay? There's no cartilage on them. And the first type of bronchiole is called a terminal bronchiole. Um, and the second type is called a respiratory bronchiole. The respiratory bronchioles have little air sacs attached to them, so they have little alveoli attached to them. Those are little air sacs. The terminal bronchioles do not have air sacs. The respiratory uh, bronchioles do have air sacs, so that's why we um, name them that way. And then at the very end, we have the lobes of alveoli. So there's lobes of these um, air sacs that are called alveoli. Okay, so that's how we get the air down. This is a conducting system. We're going to conduct the air all the way down until we get to the respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar resp uh, alveoli. And once we're there, um, now this is our, this is actually where uh, air is going to get exchanged. So this is more of a, instead of conducting, that's more of a respiratory portion. We're actually going to have gases exchanged. Let's take a look here then and look at the um, structure of the alveoli a little bit bigger. Um, this, of course, is your bronchiole right there. So there's a, a um, terminal bronchiole. And then here we see the respiratory bronchiole because we see the alveoli. So the alveoli are attached to it. Uh, and, then, and then you can see a, a lobule of all those alveoli. And if you look around the alveoli, there's a couple of things that are surrounding the alveoli. First of all, there are these um, bands of elastic fibers surrounding <coughs> them. Okay, so you can kind of see some bands of elastic fibers. That's because once you get the air all the way down into those little alveoli, the alveoli are going to expand. And then when you want to expire and you want to breathe that out, those rubber bands are going to help to bring those alveoli, kind of compress them a little bit to force the air out. 
right? So there are some diseases that will actually damage those elastic fibers. So when you get into pathophysiology and things like that, you're going to learn about diseases like emphysema and some other diseases where you actually damage the elastic fibers and they can't compress. Okay. Um, there's also surrounding them, if we look, we can see blood vessels, and those are little capillaries. So the blood vessel coming to the lungs from the heart is called the what? Pulmonary artery. So here we have our pulmonary artery, and it branches and branches and branches into the little capillaries, and the capillaries all surround each one of those little alveoli. And when they're there, they're picking up what? Oxygen. So that blue blood, that deoxygenated blood, then becomes red, and then all those capillaries are going to, to merge back together to form the smallest of the veins, which is called the venule. And then that's going to go back to the left atrium, right? So we can see the blood vessels. We can see the pulmonary artery coming down, branching into the capillaries, and then merging back together and forming that pulmonary vein. So while those capillaries are surrounding those alveoli, they're picking up oxygen. Okay, they're, the, the capillaries are picking up oxygen uh, from the alveoli. Okay. Um, all right, now, the, where they touch, where the capillary touches the alveoli, that's called the respiratory membrane. It's the respiratory membrane. And um, we'll show you this picture here. Guess that's as big as we're going to get it. It's not as, not as big as it used to be. Um, so this is this is an alveolus. It's one alveolus, right? And we can see that it's made of simple squamous cells. And there's some other cells that surround it. Like here's an alveolar macrophage. Um, a macrophage does what? It eats. It's engulfing things. So and because it's resident, it's a resident of the lungs. It's called an alveolar macrophage. There's some other cells in there that are also going to help with the immune system. But you can see the blood vessels here, too. Here's the little capillaries where they're touching the alveolus. So right where the capillary touches the alveolus, that's the respiratory membrane. So that's where the exchange of gases can go through. Anywhere they touch, anywhere a capillary touches an alveolus is called the respiratory membrane. Oh, there's a bigger picture. All right, so right here is a respiratory membrane. Right here is a respiratory <laughs> membrane. Anywhere they touch, that's where the respiratory membrane is. So if we take a look at the respiratory membrane, this is basically what we're seeing. So up on top here, this is the capillary. Down in the bottom, this is the alveolus. So here's one. This is a simple squamous cell, right? And then this is a simple squamous cell, too. And then in between the two, this is the simple squamous from the alveolus, this is the simple squamous from the capillary, in between the two is a basement membrane. So those three things right there together, that forms the respiratory membrane. Oxygen's going to move from the alveolus into the blood, and then into the red blood cells so that that can be um, delivered to tissues. Carbon dioxide's going to move from the blood, across that respiratory membrane, into the alveolus so that we can breathe it out. So um, that's going to be important. Um, we're going to go over how that works. It works based on pressures, and we'll talk about that next time we meet. The other thing that I want you to see is there's this blue line in here of this oily substance. It's called surfactant. So for, surfactant is on the inside of the alveoli, and they produce a surf, uh, like a surface tension so that the alveolus doesn't collapse. Right? Because it's got these elastic bands around it that are trying to collapse it. The surfactant causes, it creates a surface tension so it doesn't collapse. So we know babies that are born prematurely, they don't have this surfactant being produced. So they have to be given a gas with surfactant in it so that their little alveoli um, stay open and don't collapse. And then I'm just going to go into the lungs, and then that'll be it for today, and then we'll pick it up again next week. So we have um, the left lung and the right lung. If we look at the left lung, we see there's a notch here in it. So the left lung's a little smaller than the right lung. We call that notch the cardiac notch. Okay, because why? Because that's where the heart sits. The heart sits off to the left side a little bit, right? So we've got this little notch. 
that gives us only enough room for two lobes in the left lung. We have a superior lobe and an inferior lobe. They're divided by a fissure that's called the oblique fissure. Okay? It's called the oblique fissure. If we look at the right lung, the right lung has an inferior lobe, and that superior lobe is kind of divided in half. And the upper part is called the superior lobe, and the lower part is called the middle lobe. So we just we added a little bit of more lung when we sep it separated out into the two lobes. So we still have that oblique fissure that would separate the inferior and superior lobe, but then there's also a horizontal fissure that separates the superior lobe and the middle lobe. Now, if we look at the medial side of the lungs, you know, facing into the mediastinum, there is an area in there that's called the hilum. And the hilum is where all of those, the blood vessels come in and then those primary bronchi come in. So that's called the hilum. And when you look at it, um, the pulmonary artery is always on top. Um, and then underneath that, we see the pulmonary vein and the primary bronchus. Okay, so there's two pulmonary veins, one pulmonary artery, one bronchus, all in that hilum area. Okay. Any questions on this? Kind of gives us all the anatomy that we need to get started. When we meet next week, we'll start talking about the physiology, right? We'll talk more about the comprehensive exam once we get a little bit closer to it. All right, so... Um, we're going to go through chapter 23 and finish it up. There's some heavy physiology stuff on here, so I want to make sure that you guys understand this. Um, we already went through all of the uh, physical um, anatomy of the upper respiratory system, the lower respiratory system. We talked about the, um, the larynx. We talked about the trachea, the bronchi. We went over the bronchioles, the terminal bronchioles, the respiratory bronchioles, and then the alveoli. So we talked about the physical attributes of all of those anatomical structures. Uh, and then we finished up with talking about um, the respiratory membrane. And we said that when the pulmonary artery brings the blood to the alveoli, that blood is deoxygenated and the alveoli have to give the oxygen to the blood so that when the blood leaves through the pulmonary veins, it's then oxygenated. So today we're going to start by looking at several different um, physiological processes that happen in the lungs, all under the term respiration. Respiration. So respiration... Um, we can divide respiration into either external respiration or internal respiration. And um, external respiration is three different processes. It's bringing the air in and out of the lungs. That's called pulmonary ventilation. So just breathing the air in, breathing the air out, that's called pulmonary ventilation. And we have to talk about, well, how does that happen? How does air come in and out? <coughs> then we're going to talk about the process of the gases. The gases have to diffuse from the alveoli into the blood, and then from the blood into the tissues, and then from the tissues back into the blood, from the blood back into the alveoli. So in other words, we breathe in oxygen, Oxygen diffuses from the alveoli into the blood, from the blood into the interstitial space, and then carbon dioxide will move from the interstitial space to the blood, and then from the blood back into the alveoli so we can breathe it out. So we're breathing oxygen in, trying to get it to the tissues, and then we're taking carbon dioxide, which is a waste product, and bringing it back to the lungs and breathing it out. So that's gas diffusion. And so there's some physiology behind that on how that happens. We have to talk about that. Then we're going to talk about um, um, oxygen and carbon dioxide transport. How do we transport this in the blood? 
okay? And that's probably going to be the easiest part of what we're going to talk about today. So those three things, pulmonary ventilation, gas diffusion, and transport, those are all part of external respiration, okay? Once the oxygen is in the tissue, and the oxygen kind of has to be breathed in by each individual cell, so just moving the oxygen into each individual cell, that's called internal respiration. Internal respiration. Simple process, it's just gonna go by diffusion. Oxygen moves easily across the uh, phospholipid bilayer. It's just gonna move into the cells. Um, so that's internal respiration. Moving oxygen into the cell, moving carbon dioxide out of the cell. And it's all between the cell and the interstitial space, okay? That is internal respiration. When we get to chapter 25, we're gonna talk about how does that cell use that oxygen, and that is called cellular respiration, right? So we've got these processes, yes? Um, so this is all within the cell and it like just circulates through? Yep, so internal respiration is only the crossing of gases across that um, membrane of the cell. That's internal respiration, that's it. Okay. External respiration is just getting it to the interstitial fluid and then getting it out of the inter uh, interstitial fluid and out to the environment. Right. So we've got to talk about each one of these different processes. <clears throat> and I just wanted to kind of explain that to you. So first we're going to start out by looking at pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation. <clears throat> pulmonary ventilation is just bringing the air into the alveoli and getting the air out of the alveoli, right? And so how this works is by pressure. Air always is going to move from a higher pressure to a lower pressure, right? And then when you blow out, the air is moving from the high pressure where you're blowing to the low pressure, right? Wind always moves from the high pressure to the low pressure, right? When you're walking, you're more apt to go towards the low pressure as wind is against your back. So air is always going to move from high pressure to low pressure. All right, so we have to look at the alveoli and the external environment. And the external environment has um, a pressure out here. There's, there's air atmospheric pressure. And the pressure is caused by all these different molecules that are bouncing around in it. You've got nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide and water vapors. And you've got all these molecules bouncing around. And at sea level, that pressure that each one of those molecules exerts on um, structures around it is 760 millimeters of mercury. And so when you are not breathing, when you're just in between breaths, and you're not breathing, the atmospheric pressure will be exactly the same as what's inside your lungs, what's inside your alveoli. And so you get no air movement because the pressure out here is the same as the pressure in your lungs. You guys can move those up, but you can take some and then move, move that up to the next table. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, <coughs> So what we have to do is, in order to move air into the lungs, how would we do that? Can we, do we increase the pressure out in the environment, or do we decrease the pressure in the thoracic cavity? We have to decrease the pressure in the, in the thoracic cavity. We have to make the pressure inside the thoracic cavity lower than what's going on out here so that air will move from the higher pressure into the lower pressure, right? Okay, so let's take a look at some um, physics, basic physics, okay? <coughs> All right, so we'll, well, I guess we'll start with this button here. So here we have the thoracic cavity, this box right here, that's the thoracic cavity, and inside the thoracic cavity, we have all the little air molecules that are in there, right? And so um, at rest, this pressure that all these molecules are exerting against the wall will be the same as what it is outside, right? So what we want to do is we want to lower the pressure <coughs> inside the thoracic cavity. We want to lower the pressure so that air will move from the outside in, from the higher pressure in. All right, so how do we do that? Well, if we take this size of this cavity, 
and we make it bigger, now all those air molecules have a lot more space to move around in, and they're exerting less pressure against the walls. So by increasing the size of the thoracic cavity, we are decreasing the pressure. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And if we decrease the pressure, then air is going to move in, right? Okay, so then how do we do that? How do we increase the space? How do we increase the size of the space? Well, in order to increase the size of the space, we have to use muscles. And the muscles that are going to be used are the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. So the external intercostal muscles, if we look at the lungs here, this drawing here, okay? If the external intercostal muscles are gonna bring the rib cage up like that, so now we're increasing the space that way. The diaphragm muscle, which normally sits underneath like this, and it's a dome-shaped muscle, if that contracts, then it flattens out like this. And now we've increased that space by this much. So by using the external intercostal muscles and the diaphragm muscle, we're basically increasing the size of your thoracic cavity. That's going to decrease the pressure that's in there, and air is going to move into your lungs, right? Okay, that's an active process. So bringing air into your lungs is called inhalation, and that's an active process. You have to have muscles contracting to do that. You have to have ATP, you have to have muscle contraction, that's an active process. So that's just during like a quiet breathing. If you have more forced breathing, so if you have a condition like asthma, or if you're exercising, where you have to bring in even more air than what normally comes in, then you're going to have to, um, you're gonna have to recruit some accessory respiratory muscles to try to get that to um, go faster, right? To have those, that thoracic cage get larger, faster. And so those muscles we've heard of, like the SVM, the sternocleidomastoid, the pec minor, the serratus anterior, so those are gonna be recruited along with the diaphragm and the um, external intercostal muscle to try to increase that space and do it faster, right? Again, it's an active process. So quiet inhalation and forced inhalation, those are both active processes. Okay, then if we want to exhale, if you want to exhale, then you have to increase the pressure in the thoracic cavity. Because if you make the thoracic cavity smaller, now those molecules that are in there, they're bouncing around in a really tight area, that pressure has increased. So now we have to make that area smaller to increase the pressure. Right? So how do we do that? Well, in resting, in just quiet, quiet exhalation, all we have to do is relax the diaphragm and relax the external intercostals. So if you're just quietly breathing, all you're doing is relaxing those muscles. That's going to that's make that space smaller, increase the pressure, and push the air out. Okay, if you have... Um, if you're, again, if you're exercising or if you have a disease like COPD where it's harder to get the air out, then you're going to have to recruit some accessory muscles. And those accessory muscles are going to be the abdominal muscles, like the, inter, um, like the rectus abdominis, okay? some, uh, some of the um, uh, abdominal muscles, and some thoracic muscles too, like the internal intercostals, which are going to pull that rib cage in. Right? So, Quiet exhalation is just a passive process, doesn't require any ATP, but more forced exhalation, that's an active process. So breathing, all of breathing, really, whether you're quiet or whether you're uh, forced, it's all active. It all requires muscles and it requires ATP, except for quiet exhalation. Quiet exhalation is just the relaxation of that diaphragm and that external um, and intercostal muscles, okay? Um, you've seen this, so you've seen um, like um, a person that is having trouble exhaling, you know, they're going to use all their abdominal muscles. You know, you use your abdominal muscles to do that, right? 
person that's having that is trying to inhale faster, they're going to use those neck muscles, right, Kaylee? <laughs> right, so you're using a lot more neck muscles. <coughs> Okay, so that is um, how we inhale and exhale. And going back to this, that is the pulmonary ventilation, how we get the air into the alveoli, how we get the air out of the alveoli. Okay, and it's important to know whether it's an active process or passive process and what muscles are contracting or relaxing. So you need to know that for the exams. All right. Um, now, along with that, along with the pulmonary ventilation, um, we like to measure the air that comes in and out of the lungs, right? We're scientists, we're healthcare professionals, we like to monitor the volume of air. And so, um, next, when you're in advanced A&P, you're going to actually use a spirometer hooked up to a computer, and you're going to put the spirometer in your mouth and you're going to measure the volume of air coming in and out of your lungs, right? And then you'll take those volumes and you'll add a couple of them together to come up with what we call capacities. So capacities are, um, it's just adding some of those volumes together, okay? So let's look at what those volumes are that you need to know. So we have um, a volume here when you're just normally breathing. So if you put that spirometer in your mouth and you're just normally breathing in, normally breathing out, we measure the volume coming in and out. That volume is called the tidal volume, the tidal volume. Okay, so we're just measuring it in and out, in and out, normally about 500 milliliters of air. Right? Okay, then um, we're going to measure the how much air you can possibly force out um, at the end of a normal inhalation. So you inhale, and then at the end of the inhalation, you, you try to inhale as hard as you can. And then that is called the in, uh, inspiratory reserve volume. How much you can breathe in at the end of a quiet inhalation. You try to suck it in as hard as you can. That's called your inspiratory reserve volume. There's another volume where after you quiet, after you breathe out normally, then you try to breathe out as hard as you can, and that's called the expiratory reserve volume. The expiratory reserve volume. Okay? So we can tell certain things, like a person with COPD, they are probably going to be able to have, they'll have the same amount of expiratory reserve volume, they'll be able to force the air out just as much, but it's going to take a lot longer because there's all sorts of um, constriction in there, right? So there's, there's reasons why we have to know these volumes that you'll learn later, right? So um, now, um, after you've breathed out as hard as you can, there's still air left in your lungs, even though you feel like there's no way there's any air left in your lungs. And that amount of air is called the residual volume. The amount of air left in your lungs after you breathe out as hard as you possibly can is called the residual volume. Okay? And even if you had your lungs deflated, even if you had um, you know, a collapsed lung um, and you would think that all that residual volume is gone, there's still a little tiny pocket of air left in your lungs that's called the minimal volume. So the minimal volume is part of that residual volume. So those are all the volumes that you have. You know, breathing in normally, breathing out as hard as you can, breathing in as hard as you can, what's left in your lungs at the end of breathing out as hard as you can, and then what's left in the lungs after a lung has collapsed. Okay? All right, now we come up with capacities. We're going to look at capacities and we're going to add some of these things together. So the total lung capacity that's adding everything up. It's adding up your tidal volume. It's adding plus the inspiratory reserve capacity or inspiratory reserve volume, the expiratory reserve volume, and the residual volume. It's adding up all the air that you can possibly blow out, possibly breathe in, and what's still left in your lungs. That is your total lung capacity. Okay? The vital capacity, so vital, this is what's vital for life, that's why we call it the vital capacity. Um, it, it includes the tidal volume, 
plus the inspiratory reserve and the expiratory reserve volumes. Okay, how much you can possibly blow out, how much you can possibly breathe in, and then the normal uh, volume when you breathe. So that's your vital capacity. So you're just adding these things together. Um, and then lastly, we have this functional residual capacity, and that's everything, it includes the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. So how much can you possibly breathe out, and then what's still left in there after you've breathed out? Okay. So that's the functional residual capacity. Now it's interesting to note, if we look over here at the sex differences, and we look at, um, so we look at like the inspiratory reserve volume. How much air can you possibly breathe in at the end of a normal breathing? Uh, at, in males, about 3,300. In females, 1,900. Females can't breathe in as much as the males, right? Um, expiratory reserve, you have a difference too. 1,000 versus 700, right? And that changes all your capacity then. Yep, the total lung was just the tidal volume and both reserve volumes, right? Total lung is all of it. So total lung capacity is all of it. So the tidal volume. Tidal the, volume, inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve, and residual okay. volume. All of it. Yep. So study that chart and just kind of, you'll have to memorize. Those are definitions. You know, you're just going to memorize it, right? And that went along with pulmonary ventilation. All right, so now we're going to go to the next step here. Okay, and now we're going to look at gas diffusion. So there's two things that are going to be important in here. You have to memorize numbers. <coughs> there's some numbers you're going to memorize, and you have to memorize direction. So you want to know, we're talking about oxygen and carbon dioxide. Which direction is oxygen moving at each location, and which direction is carbon dioxide moving at each location? And we normally refer to it as the blood, so we're saying, is it moving into the blood or out of the blood? Okay. So for instance, at the alveoli, you're breathing in oxygen. Okay. Oxygen is going to move into the blood. It's going to then go, so at the alveoli, oxygen moves into the blood. And then oxygen, then the blood gets delivered through the arteries to the tissues. And then at the tissues, oxygen is going to diffuse into the tissues. Okay. So that way the cells can use the oxygen. Then the cells are going to produce carbon dioxide as a waste product. So they produce carbon dioxide. Now we got to get rid of that, <coughs> that carbon dioxide. Your body thinks that carbon dioxide is an acid. It does not like carbon dioxide. It has to get rid of the, the carbon dioxide. So then that carbon dioxide will diffuse into the blood. It will get transported back to the lungs. It will diffuse into the alveoli. And then you're going to breathe it out. Right? So oxygen into the tissues, carbon dioxide out of the tissues. We're trying to get that oxygen and carbon dioxide moving in the right direction. So again, this is going to occur through, um, through pressures. Right? It's going to occur through pressures. Now, um, the thing with the gases, okay, the thing with the gases is that, you know, we have, we have all of this um, air that um, has different gases in it. So most of the gas in the air is nitrogen, right? But then you also have oxygen. Oxygen makes up about 21% of all the molecules in air. And then you have carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide makes up about 0.04% of all the gases in the air. And then you have some water vapors, right? Some water vapors. And so um, these are the two that we're really looking at. We're looking at um, carbon dioxide and oxygen, right? So when we when we say, you know, the environment has a pressure, like at sea level, the pressure, atmospheric pressure is about 760 millimeters of mercury. And we say that oxygen is 21% of that. We're, we're really saying oxygen, if we multiplied 760 by 21%, we'd come up with 
160, I believe, 160 millimeters of mercury. So that's how much oxygen is exerting on the environment out here. And we would say that that's the partial pressure of oxygen. All right, so each one of these has a partial pressure. And if we add all of them together, they make up the whole pressure of the atmosphere. All right, so we're going to be looking mostly at the partial pressure of oxygen. So we use small p and then O2. That's the partial pressure of oxygen. And we're going to talk about the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Right? So we're talking about the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, so small p, and then CO2. And again, those oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules are going to move from a higher concentration of the partial pressure of that gas to the lower partial pressure of that gas. Right? So it's moving from the higher partial pressure, oxygen, for example, will move from a higher partial pressure of oxygen to a lower partial pressure of oxygen. It's not really concerned about the other pressures. It's just the oxygen pressure, right? And carbon dioxide is going to move from a higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide to a lower pressure of carbon dioxide. It's not going to worry about the pressures of the other gases. So we're always looking at the partial pressures of these gases, OK? All right. So, um, we are going to look at how, at two locations then, um, we're going to start, and again, we're still in external respiration, but we're going to start by looking at what happens at the alveolus. And I know it's hard to see this probably from the back, but I'm going to draw it then um, after we're done talking about it, okay? So when you breathe that air in, you're breathing the oxygen in, we'll start with the oxygen. The oxygen gets down into that little air sac called the alveolus. And when it gets down there, the partial pressure of oxygen is 100 millimeters of mercury. That's the partial pressure. You know, it was 160 out here, but by the time you breathe it in and it's mixing with the other gases that are already in there, uh, it's going to lower the pressure, the partial pressure of oxygen will lower to about 100 millimeters of mercury. Okay. That's a number you have to memorize. All right. Now, the blood that's coming up to the lungs, what blood vessel is coming up to the lungs from the heart? The pulmonary arteries, all right? So the capillaries from those pulmonary arteries, that blood is going to be what? Deoxygenated or oxygenated? It's deoxygenated, which means it doesn't have a lot of oxygen in it which means the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be pretty low, right? So the partial pressure of oxygen that's coming up to that alveolus has a partial pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury, right? So the inside the alveolus, we have a PO2 of 100. In the blood coming up to the alveolus, we have a PO2 of 40. We said that oxygen molecules will move which direction? Yeah, they're going to move towards the lower. So oxygen molecules start moving into the blood, right? That's how we're going to get oxygen into the blood. Now our blood is oxygenated, and it's going to go back to the heart by what vessel? The pulmonary veins. So here's the capillaries of the pulmonary veins. And they've been, you know, oxygen's been diffusing into those capillaries. Now the partial pressure of oxygen, the PO2 of oxygen, PO2 increases to 100. It can't get any higher than what the alveolus is. It can only go as high as what the alveolus is. So now our PO2 is 100. Now we have oxygenated blood. We have a lot of partial pressure of oxygen, lots of oxygen molecules in the blood. Okay? All right. So now that oxygen is going to travel back to the heart, right? It's going to go back to the heart. And then once it's at the heart, it's going to lose a little bit of pressure because it's going to lose some of those oxygen molecules. Can you think of why? Why at the heart would we lose a little bit of those oxygen molecules before going out to the systemic arteries? Because the heart needs it, right? The heart needs the oxygen too. So those, the oxygen will go out through those coronary vessels. And what we see happening is by the time the blood gets to the tissues, 
Okay, now this, here's our systemic artery coming down. Now we're at the tissues. The CO2 drops just a little bit to um, 95. It drops to 95. So instead of having a PO2 of 100, we now have a PO2 of 95. Still pretty good. We look at the oxygen levels in the tissue. And the tissue has been busy using up the oxygen. Using up the oxygen to create ATP. So it's using it, using it, using it. So the tissues, is gonna, that's going to have a low PO2. And the PO2 in the tissues is 40. The blood coming up to it, the systemic arteries coming up to that tissue has a PO2 of 95. Which direction does oxygen diffuse? It's going to diffuse out of the blood and into the tissues, right? So it's going to be giving its oxygen molecules. The oxygen molecules are diffusing out. And as it's doing that, the partial pressure in the blood starts to drop. And it drops and drops and drops. It drops down to 40. It, it's not going to go any lower than what the tissues is. So it's going to drop down to 40. Okay? So now we have deoxygenated blood. The partial pressure of oxygen is low because we don't have as many oxygen molecules. Partial pressure, the PO2 is only going to be 40. And then that blood is going to go back up to the heart. Okay, now we have that blood coming up, um, back, it goes back to the heart and then back to the lungs, and now we're still at a PO2 portion. Okay, and it's going to happen all over again. Oxygen will move from the alveolus into the blood. Now it's oxygenated. That blood's going to move down to the tissues. The oxygen's going to leave the blood, go into the tissues. Now we have deoxygenated blood again. That's going to go back to the lungs, pick up more oxygen. And it just keeps going around and around like that, right? So that's our, um, that's oxygen. Now, if we look at it, if we want to draw that out a little bit so we can put both things in one place, okay, what we can do is um, draw, so here's our alveolus. Here's the alveoli, alveolus. Here's our heart, okay? And then here's our cell, here's our tissues, right? So um, then we want to draw in our blood vessels. We know the blood vessel that's leaving the lungs and going to the heart. What is the name of that vessel? Pulmonary, those are the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins leave the lungs, go back to the heart with oxygenated blood, and then the heart's going to pump it out, and then it's going to go through systemic what? Arteries or veins? Arteries. All right. And then that blood gets to the tissues. Then they become the systemic, what? As it comes back to the heart, it's called the systemic veins. All right? It's deoxygenated. And that blood is going to go back to the lungs so that it can pick up oxygen. The blood vessel leaving the heart is called what? Pulmonary, pulmonary arteries. Okay, you guys, you have to understand, um, you have to understand the blood vessels, right? You need to understand the blood vessels, because if you don't understand the blood vessels, then you're going to have a hard time answering the questions, because it's going to ask you direction, it's going to ask you, um, the tests are going to have questions on the specific um, PO2s, all right? So um, when we look at O2, so we're looking at PO2. PO2 can only be, it can be 100 millimeters of mercury. It can be 95 millimeters of mercury. And it can be 40 millimeters of mercury. These are the only three numbers that we're going to use. Okay? These two, that means there's high oxygen content. This one, 
is low oxygen content. Low pressure, low oxygen, right? All right, so let's take a look at these vessels then. As the blood is leaving the lungs, do you think the oxygen content should be high or low? Yeah, so it's gonna be high, right? And so it is, we see that as the blood leaves the lungs and goes back to the heart, it's 100, the PO2 is 100 millimeters of mercury. At the heart, we drop off a little bit of oxygen, so it, the PO2 will drop to 95 in the systemic arteries, just because we dropped off a little O2 there, okay? All right, it's still high though, and we get to the tissues, and what happens to oxygen at the tissues? Oxygen molecules are going to leave the blood and go into the tissues. So as oxygen is leaving, what's going to happen to the um, PO2 in these vessels? Is it going to be high or low? low? It's going to be low. So in the systemic veins, the PO2 will be 40 millimeters of mercury. And by the time it gets to the pulmonary arteries, it's still going to be 40 millimeters of mercury, okay? Now at the alveolus, you just breathe in, so your PO2 is going to be higher, right? So your PO2, as you breathe that in, is 100 millimeters of mercury. So again, which way are the oxygen molecules at the alveolus, which way are they going to move? Are they going to move into the blood or out of the blood? Into the blood, right? So O2 molecules here will move into the blood. That's going to increase your PO2 in the blood. And we just keep going around and around and around and around with O2. Does that make sense? So you have to memorize those numbers. You need to know direction. Is it moving into the blood, out of the blood, at the alveolus, at the tissues? What is it doing? How yep. Come when you can, um, Interesting. We'll talk a little bit about that because um, it's not, we'll talk about that in transport. So just hold that thought. That's very good. All right. So now let's talk about carbon dioxide. Okay. So carbon dioxide is a little different. Carbon dioxide is a waste product. We want to get rid of the carbon dioxide. So the tissues make carbon dioxide as a waste product. And so the blood that's coming up to the lungs is going to have a high carbon dioxide content. And so the PCO2, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, is going to be a little higher. It's going to be 45, okay, 45. And in the alveolus, the PCO2 is going to be a little bit lower because we just breathed it out. So the PCO2 in the alveolus is 40. So those are the only two numbers you have to know with carbon dioxide, 45 and 40, right? 45 is high, 40 is low. There's not as big of a gap between them, right? So it's not going to move out quite as fast, but it's still going to move out. And so carbon dioxide molecules will move from the high PCO2 of 45 to the low PCO2 of 40. Carbon dioxide <coughs> molecules are moving out of the blood into the alveolus. And they'll keep doing that until the PCO2 equals 40. Again, it can't go any lower than what's in the alveolus. So now it's down to 40. Okay, so now we have a PCO2 of 40. And that blood is going to go all the way to the tissues. And then at the tissues, it has a low PCO2 in the blood, but the tissues have been busy. They've been producing CO2 as a waste product. So now the PCO2 in the tissues is 45. It's 45. So carbon dioxide molecules will move from the high pressure, PCO2 of 45, into the blood where the PCO2 is only 40. Carbon dioxide moves into the blood. It'll keep moving into the blood until the PCO2 raises up and is now at 45. So now we have a higher CO2 content. That's going to go back to the lungs, and we're going to breathe it out. Go back, we breathe it out. Okay? Okay, so... If we were to look at our thing here, 
Okay, and I'm actually going to draw a new one because it'll get just a mess. Here we have our alveolus. Okay, here we have our heart. Here we have our cell tissues, right? Okay, all right, and then we have our blood vessels. So we've got we have this blood vessel. This blood vessel. Same names for everything. These are pulmonary veins. Yep. Systemic arteries. Systemic veins. And pulmonary arteries. This is the alveolus, and this is the tissue. Okay, okay we're talking about CO2. CO2 we want to breathe out. Okay, CO2 we breathe out. So if we're breathing that CO2 out, the CO2 inside the alveolus is going to be a little lower. Now remember, we said the PCO2 can either be 45, which is high, or 40, which is low. All right. So if we're breathing it out inside the alveolus, it's going to be lower because we're breathing it out. So the PCO2 in the lungs, in the alveolus, will be 40 because we were breathing it out. If we look at the tissues, the tissues are busy making CO2 as a waste product. That's what happens when you're making glucose. You have to have a waste product. Their waste product is CO2. So the PCO2 here is going to be high. It's going to be 45. So it's high here and it's low here. Right? Okay. So. Let's look at the pulmonary arteries, and we'll just start here, and we'll say the PCO2 here is going to be high, so the PCO2 is 45. Carbon dioxide molecules move which direction? Yep, they move out of the blood, so we're moving carbon dioxide out of the blood into the alveolus, and then we're going to breathe it out. We keep moving that CO2 until the PCO2 over here becomes 40, so it becomes low, right? The blood's moving this way, it gets down to the, through the systemic arteries, still PCO2 of 40, and it comes up to the tissues. The tissues has, have a PCO2 of 45, the blood has a PCO2 of 40, carbon dioxide is going to move where? Into the blood, so we're moving CO2 into the blood. That's going to increase the PCO2, and it can only increase as high as what the tissues is, so it's going to increase it to 45. That blood gets back to the lungs. Nothing happened to it. We're going to breathe it out. Now it's low. We're going to go back to the tissues. We're going to pick some up. Now it's high. Go back to the lungs, breathe it out. Now it's low. And we just keep going over and over and over, right? So that is, um, so that then is um, the next part of external respiration, which was, which was caused, called gas diffusion, right? So that was gas diffusion, moving oxygen into the blood and then into the tissues, moving carbon dioxide into the blood, and then into the alveolus. That was gas diffusion. Right, there'll be several questions on that on the next exam. Last thing we have to talk about with external respiration is transport. Okay, transport. This is going to be easier. <laughs> so we're going to talk about oxygen transport and carbon dioxide transport. Okay, how is it transported in the blood? So um, we'll look at that on using... <clears throat> 
these slides down here. Okay. And so, first of all, so Marianne asked a really good question. She said, well, you know, the aorta is delivering the blood, right, that has high in oxygen. How is there enough oxygen by the time you get down to your legs? Well, the thing is, is that the hemoglobin is what's going to carry the oxygen. Do you remember that? We said each red blood cell has about 250,000 um, hemoglobin. Each one have 14 groups that each can carry one oxygen. So each red blood cell can carry about a million uh, oxygen molecules, right? Well, as long as it's bound to hemoglobin, the oxygen will not be released. It won't be released. It'll stay in the hemoglobin, um, locked into the hemoglobin. But when it happens to get to a tissue that's active, when there's a tissue that's actively metabolizing, then the hemoglobin will release the oxygen molecule, and then the oxygen molecule can diffuse into the tissue based on partial pressures. Okay? So hemoglobin's not going to let go of that oxygen until it gets somewhere that needs it. Right? It needs it. So how do we know if the tissues are metabolizing? What are some signs that we know? Well, during metabolism, we said, you know, when ATP is produced, the other thing that's produced is heat, right? 60% is heat, 40% is ATP. So if a tissue has an increase in temperature, the hemoglobin will drop the oxygen. Then the oxygen can diffuse based on partial pressure. It will diffuse into that tissue, okay? The other thing is pH. If the tissues are real acidic, okay, if they're acidic, that means they're producing a lot of CO2. You know, they're producing CO2. CO2, the body thinks, is an acid. So if the cells are active and they're producing CO2, the um, tissues become more acidic, the pH drops, then the hemoglobin will let go of the oxygen and the oxygen can diffuse into the tissues. Okay? All right, so that's oxygen. Oxygen is going to be carried... Um, the majority of the time by hemoglobin. So that's what you really need to know. And then what will cause the dissociation of hemoglobin and oxygen? Temperature changes like heat will cause the um, hemoglobin to let go, and then an acidic environment, so a decrease in pH. All right, then we look at carbon dioxide, right? So carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide... Um, so here's the tissues, and carbon dioxide moves into the blood, and some of the carbon dioxide is going to be carried freely in the plasma. Some of it's going to be carried um, inside the red blood cell by hemoglobin. But the majority of carbon dioxide is going to be converted into this acid that we call carbonic acid. Okay, carbonic acid. And so it's a buffer. And when you get to advanced A&P, you're going to talk about the buffer systems in the body. One of the ways that we can get rid of that acid, that carbon dioxide acid, is by converting it to carbonic acid. So then that can get carried to the lungs. Carbonic acid will release the carbon dioxide, and then you can breathe it out. So that's one way we can get rid of that carbonic acid. The other way that we can get rid of it is that as the blood goes through the kidney, the carbonic acid will dissociate into um, a bicarbonate and um, hydrogen, and then we can urinate the hydrogen out. Either way, we're getting rid of acid. Hydrogen is an acid. Carbon dioxide is an acid. Okay? So carbonic acid. So like 70% of carbon dioxide will be carried as carbonic acid. Right? Okay. Um, now, a couple of other things uh, at the end here, and then I'm just about done. I want to talk about um, the control of your breathing. Are you guys doing okay, or do you need a break? Because I've been talking for a while. Do you want a quick break? i got about probably 10 minutes left, and we're done. But if you want a quick break, we can break. You're okay? All right. So, Okay. All right, so the rate and rhythm of your breathing. You know, you never even think about it, right? When you're breathing, you don't even think about it. There are two um, control systems really in your body. One is centrally located, which means it's in the central nervous system. The other one is real, is more local, 
So it's um, in the, you know, by the lungs itself, um, regulated by a couple of blood vessels in the periphery. So we're going to talk about those two things, and then that'll be it. So in, um, in, the, central, um, in the central nervous system, let's see, I know I have a picture here. There. So in the central nervous system, so here's your, you know, here's your spinal cord, and then here's the brainstem. This is the medulla oblongata. And remember we said the medulla oblongata was where you had your respiratory center, your primary respiratory center, and your cardiovascular center. All right, well, here's what specifically it is. There is an area in the medulla oblongata that sets the rhythm of your breathing. And that is called the respiratory rhythmicity centers. Respiratory rhythmicity. So it's, it's, it's actually controlling the rhythm of your breathing. And in that respiratory rhythmicity center, there's a dorsal, there's a dorsal um, respiratory group and a ventral respiratory group, dorsal and ventral. The dorsal um, respiratory group, that's going to control the rhythm of your breathing when you're just at rest. When you're just resting, quietly breathing, the dorsal respiratory group, that's going to control your, ry your rhythm of breathing. So if that's destroyed, you cannot breathe on your own. Okay? And then we have the ventral respiratory group. And the ventral respiratory group is going to control the rhythm of your breathing when you're more um, forced breathing or more actively breathing. You know, like during exercise, during certain conditions, health conditions, then the ventral respiratory group kicks in. Okay? So we have those two areas um, in the medulla oblongata. Know that dorsal respiratory group is for just quiet breathing, and ventral respiratory group, that's going to be for more active breathing. Okay. Then we have, or more forced breathing. Then if we look just above that, and we look into the pons, um, there's a couple of other areas in the pons that also help um, for your conscious control over breathing. Right? Conscious control over breathing. Um, no, no, we're not showing them conscious control for breathing. Um, there's a couple of other higher centers that are going to be in that, that can they can fine tune what is going on. Um, they can fine tune or they can adjust the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group. So they can adjust the medulla oblongata. And we're not going to go into the two. We're not going to talk about the pneumotaxic or the apneustic. We just need to know that the pons has a respiratory center that can adjust the rhythm of your breathing. It can adjust what the dorsal respiratory group is doing. And it's getting information from the higher centers in the cerebrum. It's getting information from your limbic system, okay, so from like your emotions, from your hypothalamus, from your cerebral cortex, okay. So um, those are the those are centrally located respiratory centers. Now there's also um, peripheral receptors, and those are all chemos up here. Okay. Yep, no, no good picture for this. So um, let's go down here. All right, so um, there's also in the, in the um, well, I should mention this. How, does, how do those areas know that? Um, you know, floating around or moving around this area is the cerebral spinal fluid. And in that cerebral spinal fluid, there are, um, there's, you know, you're going to have oxygen and carbon dioxide content in there. There are chemoreceptors that are going to sense how much the level of carbon dioxide, and they're the ones, the chemoreceptors are going to activate um, those uh, different groups. And really, it's the carbon dioxide. So here's the, here's like the, um, 
cerebral spinal fluid chemoreceptors, they're going to detect the level of carbon dioxide. And when that carbon dioxide levels get high, that's going to force you to want to breathe out. Okay? And then when the carbon dioxide levels are lower, then you're going to breathe in. So it's carbon dioxide which really causes you to breathe in and breathe out. All right? So we have that in the um, central nervous system. We also have chemoreceptors in the peripheral nervous system. So where your carotid arteries are coming up your neck, okay, as the carotid arteries are coming up your neck and it splits, there's chemoreceptors there. And then in the arch of your aorta, there's chemoreceptors there. And they're detecting the levels of carbon dioxide in your blood. Okay, so centrally it's detecting in the cerebral spinal fluid. Out in the periphery, it's detecting it in the blood. And it will also send... Um, it'll, it'll send those messages to the, to the medulla oblongata to adjust your rhythm of breathing. Okay? All right. Um, so those are the receptors. The last thing is we want to talk about um, right at the lungs. All right. So at the lungs... Do an alveolus again, and then we're going to do a blood vessel, one big blood vessel. Okay, so there's your alveolus and there's your blood vessel, and oxygen is going to move into the blood. Carbon dioxide is going to move out of the blood right there, all right? So locally, in the lung itself, if we think of all the different structures in the lung, the lung can locally control the amount of oxygen coming in to certain areas of the lungs and carbon dioxide leaving certain areas of the lungs. Okay? So if we think about it and we say, okay, how can we control, how do the lungs control how much air comes into the lungs? Yeah? Of what? Yeah, of not the vet, well, tubes, right? Of the of the airways. So if we dilate, if we dilate the bronchi, right, we're gonna bring more air into the lungs. Right? That makes sense? So we can increase the amount of air coming into the lungs by dilating the bronchi. So or bronchiole. So that would be bronchiole dilation, all right? And that is going to affect what we call alveolar ventilation. Alveolar ventilation is how much, how much air, how much oxygen is actually coming into the alveoli. So if we want more air coming into the alveoli, we can dilate those bronchioles. Okay? What happens in asthma? They're spasms. The bronchioles are spasms, right? And they're a lot smaller, so alveolar ventilation is going to be a lot lower, right? It's going to be a lot lower in asthma. So we can affect alveolar ventilation by sending out chemicals that will make those muscles surrounding those bronchioles relax and dilate those bronchioles. And that's called alveolar ventilation. Then the second way that this can be controlled um, locally is by what we call perfusion. Because even if we bring in a good amount of air, if we don't have enough red blood cells or blood in here, there's nothing for the oxygen to be bound to, right? So perfusion is how much blood is moving up to that alveolus. How much blood are we getting? So if we want to increase the oxygen content of our blood, we would have to do what to perfusion? increase it. So what would happen to those blood vessels? They'd have to dilate, right? So we would get vasodilation in order to increase perfusion. So really locally, right there locally at the lungs, we're able to make changes. You can change the alveolar ventilation, you can change the perfusion, okay? Okay, um, so a couple of terms that are going to be very important for you to know.
um, because I told you that it's the carbon dioxide that is the most important. We have um, hypercapnia and hypocapnia. Capnia meaning carbon dioxide. So hypercapnia means what? Excessive carbon dioxide in the blood, right? So we've got excessive, we've got too much carbon dioxide in the blood. How do you think that happens? It's not being released, okay? It's not being released, so it's in the blood. When does that, when do you think that would normally happen? When, what are you doing with your breathing? Is, is it going too fast or too slow? Too slow. So we would call that hypoventilation. So hypoventilation, when do we hypoventilate? Hypoventilate means breathing too slow. When brain damage? Coming out of anesthesia? Right? Coming out of anesthesia and your body's just not, it's, it's still breathing way too slow. Your body needs more oxygen. You should be breathing more, and you're not. That's hypoventilation. That is going to, um, that is going to increase the amount of carbon dioxide in your, um, that's going to increase the amount of um, carbon dioxide in your blood, which is going to make it a more acidic environment. Remember, carbon dioxide is an acid. So if you're not breathing it out and it's high in your blood, now you're in an acidic condition. You know, and that would be like respiratory acidosis because you're not able to breathe it out. Right? So you're going to learn about that. So um, now we have this other one that's called hypocapnia. Hypocapnia, that's going to be more of an alkaline because now you're saying you don't have enough carbon dioxide in the blood. That's more alkaline. That could be a condition called respiratory alkalosis. Okay, Again, not a good condition to have. Hypocapnia means you don't have enough carbon dioxide in your blood. So what are you doing? You're breathing too much of it out. When does that happen? When you're hyperventilating. So when you are hyperventilating, so that would be caused during hyperventilation. You're breathing it. <sighs> You're just breathing way too much of it out. Now you don't have enough acid in your blood. Now you're going to be in an alkalosis state. So now it's a respiratory alkalosis state. Okay. So we've got it. And then if it can't be fixed at the respiratory area, we're going to fix it at the urinary area where we can, um, we can produce more acid um, in the urinary area or get rid of acid. All right, so that's, that's it. Um, we are going to make sure that on Friday you bring your Chapter 22 and Chapter 23 case studies because we're going to go over those in the lab. Okay. Are there any questions? All right. All right. Yes, you. You're welcome. Yes. You're very welcome.